My name is Fabrizio Ziribotti. I am a professor at the Department of Economics of the University of Zurich and the academic director of the UBS International Center for Economics and Society. It is my greatest pleasure to chair this session on monetary policy and currency markets in a volatile world. I would like to welcome and introduce the panelists. I will present them in the order in which they will give the presentation, starting from uh, Professor Jordi Galli, who is uh, the director of the Centre de Recerca en Economie Internationale, CREI, and a research professor at the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. After obtaining his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1989, he has been a professor at Columbia University and New York University. He is currently the president of the European Economic Association, which is the most important association of academic economists in Europe. Jordi is regarded as one of the intellectual leaders of the new Keynesian macroeconomic school, which embeds principles and ideas of the classical work of John Maynard Keynes into the rigorous framework of modern macroeconomic analysis. His research focuses on the causes of business cycle fluctuations and on the conduct of monetary policy, including how central banks should set interest rates and manage exchange rates. Among his many academic distinctions, let me mention the prestigious Irio Janssen Award of the European Economic Association. Thomson Reuters places him in a short list of citation laureates, regarded as likely future winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics. Professor Lars Svensson is the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sweden since 2007. Throughout a highly distinguished international academic career, he has been a Professor of Economic first at Stockholm University and then at uh, Princeton University. He has made fundamental scientific contributions on monetary economics and monetary policy, exchange rate theory and policy, and international macroeconomics. For many years, he has served as a member of the Nobel Committee for the Prize in Economic Sciences, which he has chaired between 1999 and 2001. Among his many honors, let me mention the great gold medal of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science and his honorary membership of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the Academia Europea. Before becoming Deputy Governor of the Bank of Sweden, he has been a member of the Economic Advisory Panel of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and has been in charge of official reviews of monetary policy in New Zealand and Norway. Then, Professor Philippe Baquetta is Professor of Macroeconomics at the University of Lausanne. He is the president of the Swiss Society of Economics and Statistics and a renowned expert in the areas of international macroeconomics, international finance, and monetary economics. After receiving his PhD in economics from Harvard University, he has held faculty positions at Brandeis University, ESADE, and Institute de Analysis Economic in Barcelona. From 1998 to 2007, he was the director of the Center of Study of Gertensee, foundation of the Swiss National Bank. So Jordi Galli, Lars Hanson, and Philippe Baquetta will give the three introductory speeches. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet has also kindly uh, agreed to participate to the panel discussion after hearing intervention from the public. Before giving the floor to the speakers, let me make some uh, introductory remarks. Uh, the consensus view among monetary economists and policymakers before the Great Recession was that central banks should control inflation and target output stabilization. The mainstream thinking was that central banks should instead ignore asset prices unless these become a threat to price stability. In an interview published last Saturday in Tigers and Tiger, Robert Schiller, a senior economist from the University of Yale, alerted that Switzerland, like other countries, may be entering a bubble in housing prices. He recommended robust measures to cool down the mortgage market and an intervention of the central bank aimed to increase interest rates. The current low mortgage rates, he argues, are among the causes uh, of the boom in housing prices. The view embraced by Professor Schiller that central banks should act preemptively in the face of the risk of asset bubbles has gained momentum in recent times in both academic and policy circles. So a first question for this panel is, what are the theoretical and empirical, and empirical foundations of uh, such policy, sometimes referred to in the economic parlance as leaning against the wind policies? Uh, is the recent crisis sufficient evidence for rethinking the objectives of monetary policy? In particular, should the central bank raise the interest rate when they detect signs of possible asset market bubbles, even though there is no increase in general inflation? Or aren't we uh, perhaps uh, 
doing some of those uh, wrong diagnoses that uh, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet was uh, mentioning this morning, and uh, are we proposing something that could do more damage than good? A second set of questions that are especially close to the heart of a Swiss audience concern the conduct of monetary policy in a small open economy which faces a strong pressure for the appreciation of its currency. As we know, the appreciation of the Swiss franc during 2010 and 2011 became a growing threat to the competitiveness of Swiss industry and ultimately to economic growth. While the standard recipe would have been a reduction in the interest rate, even a zero interest rate proved insufficient to stop the strong appreciation of the franc. In September 2011, the Swiss National Bank announced that it would purchase as many euros as necessary to stop the franc strengthening beyond 1.2 Swiss francs per euro. Such a policy is still in place and yet altogether regarded as a success. Yet uh, competitive depreciations as well as interventions to avoid appreciation have often been criticized in the past on the ground that they pass the build of the crisis on to other countries. Would such a criticism apply to Switzerland or shall one view the policy as a wise and legitimate form of doing expansionary monetary policy in a situation in which the interest rate ceases to be an effective instrument? And aside of that, is and will the peg continue to be credible, or shall one fear that the renewed turbulences in the euro area might induce too strong capital inflows that will eventually undermine the sustainability of the current exchange rate policy? Finally, what are the costs, benefits, and risks of the peg? Could one make a case for even changing the parity, given the signs of slowdown of economic growth? To address these and other questions, let me give the floor to the first speaker, Professor Jordi Galli. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, let me first uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful event and to also to congratulate them on, on the launching of this uh, new enterprise. Uh, I think this new center is bound to become a, a major uh, player in, in European economics and it's, it's certainly highly, highly welcome. So let me uh, I, I tell you about uh, some uh, recent work of uh, some recent research uh, that I have pursued that I thought uh, would be fit to this uh, particular uh, session. It's on monetary policy and asset price bubbles. Okay? So the basic question, as Fabrizio um, said at the, in his introduction, is how should monetary policy, how should central banks respond to the development of asset price bubbles and to asset prices more generally? So the pre-crisis uh, consensus on, on the matter, I think, uh, can be summarized by the uh, term uh, benign neglect. Okay? So the, it, there was a clear idea that central banks should focus on stabilizing inflation and that they should ignore asset price developments, at least to the extent that those developments didn't signal uh, uh, some risks uh, to price inflation, to price stability. Now, among the arguments that were uh, raised by many policymakers against the idea that central banks should respond to the emergence of asset price bubbles was first that those bubbles are almost by definition uh, difficult uh, to detect um, and the re uh, they are unobservable, they, they, they are the difference between the price of an asset and its fundamental value, and the fundamental value uh, is not directly uh, observable. And uh, secondly, even if they were observable, um, trying to tame them or to, to, to prevent their growth through the uh, use of uh, the interest rate as an instrument uh, may, may be a mistake because that's changes in interest rates would not affect only the bubble, uh, but also would have some, uh, you know, create some collateral damage. It would, they, would, it, they would affect sectors that may not have been contaminated by the bubble in ways that are not necessarily desirable. Now, the, the, the crisis has called into question many of our uh, former thinking about macroeconomics, and I guess this is one dimension in, in which there, there is some uh, rethinking going on. Now, I think it's fair to say that there is a, a, a consensus that is gradually uh, emerging in this post-crisis uh, uh, environment that first re recognizes 
I think most people uh, would agree on that, that uh, the presence of low and stable inflation for a substantial period of time is not a, a guarantee that, uh, uh, that, uh, fi of financial stability. It doesn't guarantee that there won't be uh, a financial crash uh, somewhere down the road. And secondly, that uh, rapid increase in asset prices uh, uh, also enhance the, the, probability, uh, the probability of a, a financial uh, crisis. So in this um, uh, new emerging uh, consensus, uh, there are often, we hear often calls for uh, what many people refer to as a leaning against the wind policy, that is a policy that would raise interest rates in response to uh, the emergence of a, of a bubble in asset prices. Okay? Now, what I have done in, my, um, in, the, in recent work is to call into question the theoretical foundations of this uh, policy, of this proposed policy. So let me summarize the, the, the main argument. What I... Um, the way I would put it is, is the following. This argument that an increase in the interest rate would uh, dampen uh, the bubble is based on the wrong intuition. It's, it, it, it's, a very, it's based on a, an intuition that is associated with the fundamental value of an asset. So, namely, that an increase in the interest rate uh, raises the rate that we discount future payoffs, dividends generated by that asset, and that lowers uh, the fundamental uh, value of that asset. Okay? Now, this, this is fine when we talk about the fundamental value of an asset, but not necessarily for a bubble. The reason is that, by definition, a bubble has no payoffs that uh, have to be discounted. The return on the bubble is the growth of the bubble itself. The reason why someone is willing to pay for an asset that has no intrinsic value or to pay more for an asset than its fundamental value is that this person believes that that component is going to grow over time. That is, that he or she will be able to resell it at a, an even higher price. Now, in a simple uh, argument based on arbitrage implies that an increase in the interest rate uh, would require, other things equal, an increase in the return that uh, investors will require on all assets. So in particular, for a bubble, that would mean that it would call for an increase in the growth rate of, of, of the bubble itself. Okay? So a policy that systematically raises interest rates in response to an emerging bubble is a policy that may tend to amplify the fluctuations in that bubble, because it may, if, it, if, if it doesn't succeed in bursting the bubble, it may actually lead to larger, a larger size of the bubble. Okay? So this is the, the basic argument. Here is the, it's exactly what I said to you, but in math, so I'll skip, uh, I'll skip that part. And I'll, let me just um, briefly report on some simulations that I have carried out in, in the context of a model in which... Uh, I have embedded uh, a bubble and in which there is a central bank th which is trying to respond to that bubble. So the, the, the framework I use departs from the standard macroeconomic framework, which is typically based on a, uh, an infinitely lived representative uh, household, because in the context of that framework, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, have uh, rational bubbles in equilibrium. So what I what I have is an overlapping generations uh, model of the kind that was originally proposed by Samuelson, Tirol, and others, which is a framework which allows for the possibility of, of rational bubbles. In addition, I, uh, I introduce a sticky prices. The presence of sticky prices makes monetary policy not neutral, and thus uh, it, uh, it allows monetary policy, or it makes room for monetary, monetary policy to respond to the bubble and to have real effects. So what you see here uh, in this equation is a simple interest rate rule for the central bank. R is the real interest rate, which the central bank can affect because of this uh, stickiness in prices. Pi T is inflation. That's a, a variable that the central bank typically responds to. And QB would be the bubble component of, of uh, the asset price in this economy. So here I'm making things as easy as possible to, to the central bank. I'm, allow, uh, I'm assuming that the central bank can observe the bubble. 
Okay, so there, there's no problem of uh, uh, observability or difficulty in detecting the, the bubble. So the question I raise is, well, should the central bank adjust interest rates in response to bubbles? That is, should that coefficient fee be, uh, be different from zero? And how aggressively, how large should that coefficient be? Okay. And again, I'm assuming that the bubble is observable in real time. So let me just report on two findings of, uh, of the model. And uh, no, those of you who are interested may, may, may look at the, at, the, at the background paper for, for the, my presentation, which is on my, uh, my website. So one finding is a positive finding, and the, uh, the second one is a normative uh, finding. So the positive finding is that a, poly, a leaning against the wind policy, that is a, a policy that systematically makes the central bank increase uh, the real interest rate in response to uh, a bubble, may amplify fluctuations in the size of asset pricing bubble. So let me show you a picture which uh, summarizes a simulation with uh, the model. So what you have here on the horizontal axis is the, is the size of that phi B coefficient, the coefficient on the, on the bubble in the interest rate rule, so it goes from minus 2 to 2, okay? And on the vertical axis, you have a measure of the volatility of the bubble, the standard deviation of the bubble. So you can see a leaning against the wind policy is a policy that would be on the right-hand side of, of this picture. So you can see that such a policy, perhaps uh, surprisingly, uh, leads to more volatility than a policy of benign neglect. A policy of benign neglect would be one that would, ha would be associated with a zero coefficient on the bubble. And in fact, in this model, we can minimize the volatility of the bubble by setting the, the coefficient in the interest rate rule to a negative value, minus one. So in fact, the central bank should lower the interest rate whenever the size of the bubble increases. Okay, precisely because a reduction in the interest rate will reduce the growth of, of the bubble. Okay? Now, but this is not necessarily the optimal thing for the central bank to do because no one said that it is optimal to minimize the volatility of the bubble. Okay? Um, so what's the main normative finding in, the, in this work? Well, by responding to, to the fluctuations in the bubble, the central bank has to strike a balance between uh, uh, two, two things. First, stabilize aggregate demand. Okay, so the reason is that an increase in the bubble increases the wealth of households that, would lead to, that leads to an increase in consumption and that may generate uh, inflation and it may generate excessive wage growth and so on. So from that point of view, it is actually optimal or desirable to raise interest rates uh, when a bubble develops. Okay? As it is optimal to raise interest rates when, whenever aggregate demand increases excessively. And an increase in the size of the bubble is just one source, one more source of this increase in aggregate demand. But on the other hand, uh, if, um, in order to stabilize the growth of the bubble, the central bank may want to lower interest rates. Okay? So uh, here is a picture that, again, based on a simulation of the model, that shows the optimal coefficient on the bubble depending on uh, the average size of the bubble as a share uh, um, of GDP. That's what you have on the horizontal axis. So we see when there is uh, the average bubble in the economy is zero, the optimal coefficient in the interest, rule, in the interest rate rule is zero. There's no point in responding to, to a bubble that doesn't exist or, 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 or which size is infinite, infinitesimally small. As the size of the bubble increases, the optimal coefficient becomes positive. So that justifies, so that would, would, uh, would uh, justify a leaning against the wind policy. Okay, so in this case, the stabilization of the bubble dominates the stabilization, sorry, the stabilization of aggregate demand motive dominates the stabilization of the bubble motive. But as the size of the bubble increases, we see that the optimal coefficient starts going down and its sign actually switches to negative. Okay? So if the, bubble, the average size of the bubble is too large, it may actually be desirable to lower interest rates in response to an increase in the size of the bubble. Now let me point to some caveats uh, of this analysis. First of all, and maybe I didn't stress this enough at the beginning, bubbles in this model are assumed to be of the rational type. Okay? And hence they have to satisfy certain uh, um, um, uh, equilibrium 
restrictions that are also uh, satisfied by other asset, asset prices. Okay? So it may very well be the case that bubbles of a different sort respond differently to interest rates. Okay? Secondly, the model ignores financial considerations. So in particular, credit is not uh, uh, a factor in this model. There are no credit uh, 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 flows. Okay? It may very well be the case that in a model in which one introduces some kind of uh, explicitly financial intermediation and some kind of financial uh, imperfections, uh, uh, the, the, the main results would be overturned. That's something that uh, I plan to pursue in, 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 in future research. Now, just to, to, con to uh, finish my presentation, let me just show you very informal empirical evidence on the relationship between interest rates and... Um, asset prices in times that now we associate, exposed with the benefit of hindsight, we associate with the presence of, of bubbles, what I call here bubbly episodes. So the three episodes are the stock market boom previous to the great uh, crash of 1929, the dot-com bubble of the 90s, and the housing bubble of the 2000s. And, and the three pictures correspond to, to the U.S. economy. Okay? So here you see the... So the, the, the red line is the stock price index. Uh, I think it's the, it's the uh, Dow Jones in, in the U.S. Before, uh, the, in the months before the crash of 1929. And the blue line is the discount rate, the, uh, which was the, the main uh, instrument of monetary policy at that time. So you can see that at that time, the, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, was uh, largely motivated by the, these in, increasing this uh, large uh, increase in, 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 in asset prices, in stock prices in particular, was raising interest rates. And we, you can see that for a long period, for a su substantial period, the increase in interest rates was not uh, succeeding at all in dampening the, the increase in stock prices. Okay? Uh, in fact, it seems to accelerate even the, the, the increase in stock prices. The next picture, same similar phenomenon, but now applied to the dot-com bubble, Okay, so you can see that, uh, so the, again, the, the red line is, in this case, the NASDAQ composite, and the blue line is the federal funds rate, and you can see how the NASDAQ composite keeps increasing at a very fast rate, even though the Federal Reserve is raising aggressively its interest rate, okay, at the end of the, of the 90s. And the final, the final picture is the one associated with the housing bubble. So here, the red line is the Case-Shiller uh, index of housing prices in the U.S., and the blue line, the federal funds rate. We see the same phenomenon. Obviously, this doesn't prove anything. This is very, just shows, you know, points to, to a correlation, but at least it's suggestive that changes in interest rates are not strongly effective at reducing uh, asset prices. Now, one thing that it's, it's worth uh, noticing is that uh, what, we, what we show here, the red line, is the observed asset price. It's not, uh, it's not the bubble. Now, to the extent that the fundamental value goes down in response to the increase in interest rates, that would suggest that the bubble would be increasing even faster than, than what the, the, the red line is, uh, the red line is uh, pointing to. So, uh, just to conclude, again, uh, it's not the purpose of, 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 um, of this uh, work, to, you know, to, to call for specific uh, policy action in response to bubbles. Instead, I just want to raise a warning flag from the theory uh, point of view um, about the potential perils associated with uh, leaning against the wind policies. And, you know, there may be a case for such policies, but I think that currently its theoretical foundations have not been made uh, sufficiently clear. Thank you very much. Jordi, I'm very happy and grateful for the opportunity and the invitation to come here and speak at this first major event of the new USB International Center of Economics in Society at the University of Zurich, which looks like it will become a very successful center. Uh, I will mostly speak or speak about the uh, 
second question that uh, Fabrizio brought up, uh, more precisely on monetary policy at or close to the zero lower bound for interest rates. Okay, when we are at a zero lower bound, when the policy rate is at or close to zero, uh, one can use unconventional or non-standard monetary policy. Uh, there are several things that can or have been tried. Uh, negative, slightly negative policy rates, forward guidance saying something about the future policy rate, ba and balance sheet policies, uh, quantitative easing, asset purchases, foreign exchange uh, interventions. I will speak uh, uh, about foreign exchange interventions. And I will uh, say a few things about uh, an old idea of mine, uh, the foolproof way of escaping from a liquidity trap. And then I'll say something about the foolproof way light, where the latter, but not the former, has arguably been practiced in reality. And my main point has to do with foreign exchange interventions. Foreign exchange interventions to prevent your currency from appreciating or even to depreciate it for monetary policy purposes I see as just another way to do expansionary monetary policy using unconventional or non-standard means. And such foreign exchange interventions is in my mind not beggar than neighbor policy. And importantly, monetary policy is not a zero-sum game. What one gains does not the other come to lose. So let me try to uh, develop this. At the zero lower bound, uh, what we can use is unconventional, non-standard monetary policy. One possibility is to have slightly negative policy rates, I mean, minus 25 basis points, perhaps even minus 50 basis points. When you look at the zero lower bound more closely, it is actually soft uh, uh, and not hard, and it is not exactly zero. One can go into that in more detail, but let me not uh, uh, go into that here. I have uh, a paper in, uh, in the Journal of Monetary Credit and Banking which makes uh, these points. But let, let me move on to forward guidance saying something about the future policy rate. Uh, during the 2008-2009 crisis and onwards, the Fed and the Bank of Canada has made announcement that they will keep their policy rate low for a longer period. And uh, one can go a step further and one can actually publish one's policy rate path, publish a forecast for the policy rate. Uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand started doing this already back in 97. The Bank of Norway in 2005, the Riksbank in 2007, and the Fed has started doing this at the beginning of, of, of this year. Then we have balance sheet policies. Uh, one can lend uh, at fixed interest rates at longer maturities. One can see that as a way of, of uh, affecting uh, policy rate expectations in the future. Uh, one can do asset purchases, uh, which has received a lot of uh, uh, attention and have been, has been done, have been done at great extent. Uh, quantitative easing, uh, uh, QE, and also foreign exchange interventions. Uh, QE is usually buying uh, domestic assets, long bonds, for instance. Uh, foreign exchange intervention is buying foreign assets, foreign currency assets, but both are balance sheet policies, expands the balance sheet. Uh, I view these as expansionary monetary policy uh, with unconventional means. Uh, what they do is that they lower long interest rates, they may increase inflation expectations, uh, and they may depreciate the currency. And that is precisely what a lower policy rate does in normal times, when you're not at a zero lower bound, but uh, can lower the policy rate. 
So I see this as just doing uh, expansion of monetary policy with, with uh, uh, different means, different instruments. And importantly, there is a zero lower bound for, for the interest rate, but there is no zero lower bound for the exchange rate. You can always affect the exchange rate if you cannot affect uh, the policy rate. And here is an idea that I suggested myself uh, in, in the year 2000. Before, when I was an academic, I could freely give advice to central banks and suggest what they should do or should not do. Now, as a central banker myself, I cannot in public give recommendations to other central banks. So nothing I say here have any implications for what Bank of Japan should be doing or what the what the uh, Swiss National Bank uh, should be doing. I can only speak uh, in public about uh, uh, monetary policy at, at uh, my own central bank. But let me say a few things, things that I said as an academic uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, so here, uh, the foolproof way to escape from a liquidity trap. Uh, a liquidity trap, that's a situation when you have a binding zero lower bound. Uh, you would like to lower the policy rate more if it was possible. You uh, have deflation or you have too low inflation. Uh, so even though the policy rate is at zero or close to zero, the real interest rate is too high. You would really like to lower it if you, if you would like to. Uh, and uh, I suggested a foolproof way for Japan in a conference uh, at the Bank of Japan in 2000. And it has three elements. The first is to announce a price level target. Say a price level 10% or more above the current price level, for instance, so as to undo any un un unwelcome deflation that you have suffered. The second is to depreciate the currency uh, uh, in line with this, say 10%, if you wanted the price level to go up by 10%, and then peg the exchange rate there and, and, and wait, keep it pegged until you have achieved uh, the price level target. And then exit. When you have a dramatic policy, you must always have a rule for exit. So when the price level has been achieved, the price level target has been achieved, resume normal monetary policy, float uh, the currency <coughs> again and go back to what you were doing before, inflation targeting or, or, or price level targeting. This will cause a temporary real depreciation of the currency. It will uh, create inflation expectations. It will reduce the real interest rate and stimulate the economy and get the economy going and inflation uh, to rise. And it's a very drastic measure. It's directly verifiable. You see what dramatic things the central bank is doing. Therefore, it's likely to be credible and have an impact on inflation expectations and work. Okay, this was a foolproof way uh, to my great disappointment at the time, uh, the, 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 the Bank of Japan did not try this. Instead, they did something else. They did the foolproof way light. And the foolproof way light doesn't have the first element, the price level target, and it doesn't have the third element, the rule for exit. And it has a variant of the second element, namely, do not appreciate and peg the currency, just intervene to prevent it from appreciating. And the Bank of Japan actually did quite a bit of that. And here we have, they, they made huge interventions uh, 2000 up through 2004. And then again uh, in, in, in 2010 and 2011. The red are the total, the blue are the US dollar interventions. So the euro interventions are, are, are insignificant there. Okay, but the Swiss National Bank has also done uh, something like this. Uh, in, uh, in September 6, 2011, there was this uh, dramatic uh, press release uh, and the Swiss National Bank announcing that it would be aiming for a substantial and sustained weakening of the Swiss franc. And uh, the way to do this was a commitment to a minimum exchange rate of 1.2. Uh, franc uh, per euro. And here is the whole, the whole uh, uh, press release uh, uh, 
a part, a part of, uh, of monetary policy history. Uh, the Swiss National Bank will no longer tolerate uh, uh, an exchange rate below the minimum rate of 1.2, and it will enforce this minimum rate with the utmost determination and is prepared to buy foreign currency in unlimited quantities. Okay, and here you can see, I don't have a pointer here, but you see there were, there were interventions in 2010, and then you see these dramatic things at the end of 2011, and you see the exchange rate stabilizing there uh, with a minimum of, of, of 1.2. 1 okay, now I want to make the point that this is not beggar thy neighbor policy. Uh, under normal times, uh, if the Swiss National Bank was facing risks of deflation and threats to the development of the real economy, it would lower the policy rate. Uh, and, but it can't because the policy rate is already so, so low. So what it is doing, it's just uh, doing more expansionary monetary policy uh, with, with other uh, uh, means. So, so preventing the currency from appreciating or depreciating it for monetary policy purposes is simply just expansion of monetary policy. And it is not beggar uh, thy neighbor policy. And why, why, why would it not be beggar thy neighbor policy? Well, beggar thy neighbor policy, that means that what you do is good for you, but, uh, but someone else in another country has to pay the cost. Well, I mean, it is true, of course, that all countries cannot depreciate their currencies against each other. We all, we all agree uh, with that. But the fact is that all countries can conduct more expansionary monetary policy with conventional or unconventional means. And with more expansionary policy in a recession, Aggregate demand will grow, GDP will grow, employment will grow, and trade, export, and import will grow. And everyone gains from such an expansion. If each country in a recession can do this, uh, and eventually get inflation at target, and get employment back to the maximum sustainable employment rate, then every, everyone gains. And looked at from this point of view, monetary policy is definitely not a zero-sum game. So, uh, although I'm not supposed to give recommendations to other central banks, I think from, 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 uh, from a practical and theoretical perspective on monetary policy, uh, using foreign exchange interventions to prevent your currency from, from, from appreciating is precisely the right policy if you're worried about uh, to low inflation and, and to, to, to weak real economy. Let me end there, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> so let me thank uh, Fabrizio for uh, organizing uh, this uh, session and for, for this uh, wonderful event, and uh, to give me the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, the new uh, Swiss monetary policy. Now, the recent years have changed completely or drastically the environment, uh, the monetary and financial environment of Switzerland, and this had a, a strong impact on the monetary policy, and in particular on the role of the exchange rate. So in these few minutes, I'd like to uh, review uh, somewhat the evolution and how the exchange rate has uh, increased its role and give some uh, uh, personal thoughts uh, and some uh, extensions maybe uh, compared to uh, the previous uh, uh, presentation by uh, Lars Svensson. Now, remember before, uh, the governor uh, of the Swiss National Bank said in 2008 that pegging the Swiss franc to the euro was not a realistic option. Or later, or still in September uh, 2008, that the Swiss franc is not an objective uh, 
and not an instrument for monetary policy. We are in a completely different world now. Moreover, uh, it was also the position of uh, the uh, central bank that foreign exchange intervention were not useful and actually were, uh, had not been used for many years. And that if needed, you could change the exchange rate just by changing the interest rate. So this was before. Now we are in a, in a new uh, world. So the, the governor of the central bank now says, with a new governor, Thomas Jordan, that we will continue to enforce the minimum exchange rate with the utmost determination. So this word comes uh, in each uh, statement, utmost. Um, and so much so that the outside world, some people uh, in the outside world uh, think that Switzerland is manipulating its currency. And for example, Daniel Groen says that uh, the Swiss peg involves currency manipulation to the same order of magnitude as Chinese intervention. This is very different from uh, five years ago where the Swiss franc was not uh, an, an objective. Um, moreover, the reserves have uh, increased. We just saw a picture on reserves. Uh, they increased uh, to, um, now to about 75% of, of GDP. So we've come from uh, like the pre-crisis situation where the exchange rate had basically no, no role, uh, was not important, to now uh, the exchange rate being uh, central to monetary policy. Uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, review that and look at the implications of that. Now, this change in the role of the exchange rate has not come overnight. Actually, it has come gradually over the years. If, for those who follow uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss financial and monetary uh, development, they, this is uh, uh, familiar. Things started well, after the... Uh, bottom of the crisis in the spring 2009, uh, several central banks started uh, with uh, monetary expansion because of low interest rates and, and uh, recession. So the Swiss National Bank in March 2009 started with uh, expansion and in particular with foreign exchange intervention. At the time, there's been a small appreciation of the Swiss franc, but it remained stable. Uh, however, it, it started to get more, uh, more important. So if you look at this graph, which is similar to the graph shown by Lars Svensson, that shows the, in blue the central bank interventions and in red the evolution of the Swiss franc. You see that in 2009 there had been uh, uh, intervention uh, and uh, then the, the Swiss franc stabilized. So this was the, the, first, uh, the, the first period. Then we had two other periods that were very important of pressure on the Swiss franc. It was uh, spring 2010, the beginning of the Greek debt crisis. Uh, and again, you see large blue uh, lines here, massive intervention. At the time where, looking from now, the Swiss franc was not so strong. So the central bank trying to weaken uh, 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 not such a strong uh, currency. And in the, in the aftermath, losing uh, uh, lots of... Uh, money by buying the euro at uh, 140 when it fell, now it's at, at, at 120. Um, but there uh, uh, the exchange rate was uh, uh, crucial in these operations and was uh, a main target for monetary policy and for these interventions. And finally came the pressure in uh, summer 2011 uh, with again the, the eurozone crisis but also the, the US debt crisis and then the pressure uh, uh, was so strong, the interventions were huge, the currency uh, appreciates, and then eventually the central bank decided to peg the, uh, the currency. Uh, so now uh, we have a stable exchange rate, but large interventions and increase in, in reserves. Now, the question uh, are what uh, are the um, uh, implications of that? So now the exchange rate is the main uh, objective uh, and I'd like to look at uh, various implications uh, on the central bank uh, balance sheet, on the balance of payments, on monetary policy, and uh, on uh, uh, one other question. Now, for the central bank balance sheet, we we'll all know that this has made the central bank balance sheet explode. And basically what we can see is that this intervention has been unsterilized. And so this is... Uh, 
a subset of uh, uh, items in the balance sheet uh, in blue, you have uh, the reserves of the central bank. And in green, you have the monetary base. So you see that the accumulation of reserves is uh, totally translated into the monetary base. And the other elements that may have been important before have disappeared, in particular the repos, the, uh, the, the pink uh, repos on the asset side, or the S&B uh, bills, uh, the, 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 the orange, have, have disappeared. So now it looks more like a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, really, between reserves and, uh, and uh, monetary base. Now, <clears throat> so this was for the, the balance sheet. I'm coming back to the monetary base in a, in a minute. The other interesting aspect is a Swiss uh, current account, because we know that the accumulation of reserves affect the current account. This is a typical thing I would uh, teach in the undergraduate uh, courses at uh, universities. So the current account uh, is to be equal to the capital uh, outflow, the private capital outflow, plus the increase in reserves. Now, over the crisis, there have been some changes in the current account, but they were not so strong. So the main change has uh, been uh, the private capital uh, flows that went from uh, typical outflows to uh, inflows. So let, uh, let me show you uh, the evolution of the balance of payments. On the left-hand side, this was before the crisis. So before the crisis, you had the red, the current account, and the blue, uh, the financial account, which represents a capital outflow. So before the crisis, there was Switzerland was exporting capital on net, and then as a current account surplus, and there was a, a nice match between the two. But since, 19, since 2009, uh, we see that the blue line that used to be negative all the time, representing an outflow, now is start to become positive on many, uh, uh, on many quarters, meaning an inflow. So a, a positive blue line is a, capi a net capital inflow to Switzerland. And therefore, the capital outflow couldn't match the current account uh, surplus. The only way to, to maintain the, this uh, situation is by intervening. And the, the, the green line now are central bank intervention. So in periods of a high blue line, this means a high capital inflow to Switzerland and a large intervention, therefore a large a green line. So now uh, uh, we have a different... Uh, behavior in uh, uh, the balance of payments. Now, all of this, of course, has implications for monetary policy. Uh, all these capital flows and the role of the exchange rate. Now, we are in a situation of a fixed exchange rate, and we know from the textbooks that in a fixed exchange rate, you do not have your independent monetary policy. Uh, so, the... Uh, Basically, in a fixed exchange rate system, your capital inflows will affect the monetary base uh, through the accumulation of reserves. Uh, now, we know that these capital inflows have been influenced by events in the Eurozone system. So, events in the Eurozone area are affecting the Swiss monetary policy and are determining the extent of quantitative easing. So, it's uh, Lars Benson mentioned before what you should do with your quantitative easing. Now, the, 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 the question is whether you can do it uh, uh, deliberately. If you have a fixed exchange rate, well, you are not free to choose your extent of quantitative easing. Let me show you the next graph that I find uh, uh, striking. The next graph shows you two uh, variables that move very close together. The blue line is the Swiss monetary base. And as we know, it has increased. But then the red line is a graph we've already seen this morning. This is the spread uh, be between Spanish tenure bonds and German bonds. So this spread is very highly correlated with the Swiss monetary base. Clearly, uh, the events in the Eurozone are highly correlated with uh, uh, the Swiss uh, uh, monetary policy. Of course, this does not show a, a, a causality, but given a fixed exchange rate, uh, uh, this is exactly the, the way it should work. No, you have a tension in the Eurozone. This leads to a capital inflow that we saw in the balance of payments. This capital inflow leads to an intervention, an accumulation of reserve that is not sterilized, and therefore an increase 
in the monetary base. And so this graph really uh, uh, illustrates uh, the, the fixed exchange rate situation where you lose the uh, independence of monetary policy. Now one uh, issue is whether uh, the Swiss uh, central bank is manipulating its currency. So there have been uh, criticisms uh, in that, um, or uh, whether uh, there is a, um, or whether maybe uh, Switzerland is more a financial intermediary or a currency manipulator. Now let me show uh, uh, the way I see it. No? We just uh, found that the tension in uh, 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 the Eurozone lead to a capital inflow towards Switzerland. This uh, uh, leads to an inflow of, of funds in the Swiss banking system and financial system in general. Part of these uh, 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 funds, they are deposited, deposited directly at the central bank at, as side deposits. Now, these side deposits uh, uh, are then uh, translated into uh, uh, purchases of foreign assets by the central bank and mainly in the Eurozone. So you have a cycle here, uh, uh, starting from the Eurozone, the capital inflow, and then going back to the Eurozone by purchases of, of the central bank. So if you see it this way, it's difficult to think of uh, uh, currency manipulation, and I see more as uh, uh, Switzerland as a financial intermediary in a uh, chaotic situation uh, in, uh, in neighboring, uh, neighboring countries. So in that case, Switzerland is providing this financial intermediation. And what is it providing? Well, it is providing liquidity because uh, uh, banks, uh, bank deposits are more liquid than, than the bonds that could be bought directly. Plus, uh, uh, investors can buy Swiss francs. So Switzerland uh, is providing a currency hedge uh, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, um, of... of um, uh, it's very valuable. And, but this currency hedge can be very costly for the Swiss economy. Imagine that reserves that keep going up uh, and go up to 100% of GDP, which is very likely the way it goes, and that there is a, a collapse in the Eurozone. I don't know how likely this is, but uh, this, is not, uh, this is part of, of, uh, of, the, of the radar screens. Uh, if the euro collapses by 20%, this means 20% of loss of Swiss GDP, meaning that uh, uh, at some stage uh, the Swiss people will have to pay that. So similarly to uh, Ellen Rye's presentation, the, the, the U.S. presented, uh, uh, gave a risk uh, uh, sharing an insurance to the rest of the world. Now uh, Switzerland is giving an insurance to the Eurozone, and this is a very uh, uh, valuable uh, service. So rather than a currency manipulator, I see more as providing uh, this, uh, these services to, uh, to the rest of the world. I'm uh, running out of time. Should I, should I conclude? Okay. Yes. Okay, let me, uh, so I had a few more thoughts, but let me conclude. So in this new, new environment, the Swiss National Bank has lost its monetary independence. Moreover, the, in, this Eurozone, in the Eurozone crisis, Switzerland is providing a valuable uh, intermediation services, but that can be very costly for, for the country. Now, this new monetary policy, in my view, is temporary because the evidence, the experience shows that fixed exchange rates do not last for long. So this very strong role of the exchange rate is going to decline over time. And this is now the role of uh, the Swiss National Bank to prepare a soft exit strategy. Thank you. Thank you. We invite a question from the public. Um, otherwise, I can. Ah. Oh. There, is, there are questions already. I, was... I have a question to Professor Shwadi Gali. One could think if you have uh, two problems, you need two instruments. So my, questions, uh, my question is first, uh, why did uh, monetarist economists think that uh, if you have uh, an inflation of asset prices uh, as opposed to inflation of the price level, why, why did they think that the interest rate could be an, interest, uh, uh, an instrument for, for, for both problems in the first place? Now, the, the, 
this uh, comes to the next question, and you showed that this is not a suited instrument. What would be a possible other instrument which would not run into the policy of the, 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 the leaning against the wind policy by, by interest uh, rates? Could what you? would be a possible instrument against asset price inflation, a different uh, instrument from interest rates? That's a question to Lars. Uh, I would like, uh, I was a question whether you could elaborate a situation where you have only two countries, but both countries are on the zero lower bound, and not only one of them. And how would your method work? In particular, does it depend very much on the exit strategy out of this uh, um, foreign exchange intervention? Because if one country buys the, exchange, oh, the currency of the other country and vice versa, uh, how would you affect the inflation expectations? And uh, for Philip, uh, I think probably I would expand your cycle a little bit further. Let's suppose the Swiss National Bank buys primarily German bonds, then essentially it would go from Switzerland to German bonds and then through the target system back to, let's say, Spain. So Spain is, Spaniards buy first the Swiss uh, currency, then the Swiss National Bank buys German bonds, and then through target two, actually, it would flow back. So if you would expand your circle this way, how would you view the financial intermediation? Because if there is a default, it's not clear that uh, Switzerland would lose much. It would just high inflation risk, which would then hurt the Swiss uh, National Central Bank. So, I, yeah, there is a question from Esfer. So I, I have two, two questions, one for Philip and one for the whole podium. Uh, I mean, the Swiss National Bank can print money, and it, by printing money it can buy, it, it produces Swiss francs, and with the Swiss francs it can buy foreign currencies. So if it prints money to buy foreign currency, why is it then hurt if the foreign currency just depreciates? So maybe you can explain, but then there is the danger that's looming always large here that when central banks print money or do unusual things, then inflationary pressure is thought to be generated. And there are many observers in the media and among economists who think that all these unusual policies that have been uh, uh, pursued over the last few years, the, the Fed policy but also the ECB policy, that they implicitly build up inflationary pressures or the poten inflationary potential, I should say, not pressures. And I want to ask the people on the podium, what are the, 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 the possibilities uh, to escape uh, uh, an inflationary period? So how, what kind of exit strategy they can choose such that, let's say, if the economy takes up, if employment increases, if inflationary pressure rises, that they can keep that they can constrain inflation. So what do the experts tell us? What, how can this be done? So I have myself a question, first for um, Jordi, perhaps and also for, for Lars and Philippe. So, <clears throat> I mean, going back to the kind of uh, uh, simple uh, argument that uh, uh, people use to relate uh, interest rates and uh, uh, say housing prices or generally asset pricing. Uh, it was mentioned in the, in the same interview about to, to, to Schiller that I mentioned. Uh, well, one of the intuitive reasons why uh, housing prices uh, might be increasing is because uh, uh, with, with low mortgage rates, a lot of people have the opportunity to, to, to buy houses, so that increases the demand and that uh, brings about increasing prices. Now, I guess the, the answer to, to this objection would be this would be the fundamental part, not the bubble part of the, of the increase in prices. But now the next question is uh, somehow when we think uh, theoretically of bubbles, we have a lot of uh, freedom in uh, uh, how we model these bubbles. So one, I don't know, uh, I'm not an, an expert of bubbles, but uh, one, one argument might be that uh, there is a relationship between something that we observe that could be in principle sun uh, or, uh, or rain, but instead of sun and rain it could be uh, the changes in fundamental prices. So there is an extent to which uh, the bubble component is related to the fundamental prices, one could argue that by uh, raising the interest rate uh, you would uh, somehow 
cool down the, 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 the possibility of a bubble by acting on the fundamental now. I don't know how, how you know, empirically valid this type of argument might be. Um, the second question, <laughs> I mean, you, make, you made a very uh, optimistic representation, Lars, of the uh, uh, pegging policy, and you argued uh, uh, convincingly and forcefully this is not a beggar thy neighbor uh, uh, type of uh, argument um, uh, policy. Rather, it's a way of doing uh, expansionary uh, monetary policy. In fact, uh, you know, if all countries did more expansionary monetary policy, perhaps uh, it would be better for, for everybody. So what is, the, what is the limit of this argument? I mean, here in Switzerland there are many views about uh, uh, this policy, and one of them is that they, they shouldn't have pegged at 1.2. They should have pegged at 1.4. So what would be the implication of uh, pushing this? Uh, if, would it just be a more expansionary monetary policy? We would have perhaps increased uh, even further the monetary base, but this has not resulted so far in inflation. And, uh, you know, if inflation uh, was to, to turn up, we could uh, start raising the interest rate. So, of course, there has to be some boundary to this, uh, to this uh, argument uh, that, uh, I mean, related also to, the, to, the, uh, to one point raised by Philippe, uh, is how, how serious an issue is the, the possibility of future capital losses, in your opinion? Is it something that uh, uh, should worry or, uh, or not worry? Daron. I actually have uh, two questions, quick ones. One is to Jordi. I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, the relevant bubbles that people have in mind must be really irrational bubbles in the sense that the ra if it's rational bubbles, this, what's going to be relevant is the interest rate in the very far future to be able to maintain uh, a bubble, for example, the real interest rate being less than the population growth rate or something <clears> like that. So short-term movements in the interest rate wouldn't, couldn't have an impact on that in any case. So, so I think what people have in mind when they're talking of this sort of informally is either some sort of bubble-like behavior from the fact that uh, when the interest rates are low, people are going for yield or, uh, or taking some risky action, some sort of risk-shifting thing, or perhaps irrational bubbles, all the stuff that Marcus or others have done. So, so I wonder how, how much your sort of conclusions generalize to that. And then the second one is more, so I guess, both to Jordi and to Lars and to, to Philip, uh, you know, and, 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 and to, uh, uh, to everybody, I guess. Uh, you know, and one thing that's not, I don't hear explicitly discussed in the discussion of uh, unconventional monetary policy, but is sort of implicit in some of the U.S. discussions, is that people in the U.S. talk a lot about uncertainty, that uh, increase in uncertainty is one of the things that holds back uh, investment and so on. You know, again, the jury is out, but uh, given the emphasis that both the academicians and others place on this, this might be a concern. So is there a danger or what can be done such that unconventional monetary policy actually doesn't increase the risk. For example, if you look in the U.S., there was a lot of uh, uncertainty in the markets about when, whether QE2 is going to come or whether QE3 is going to come. So that's some sort of uh, implicit uncertainty that's being created just by the fact that uh, some of these policies are being debated when they're going to be rolled back. Uh, of course, you can always answer that well-managed policy will not create that uncertainty, but the reality is that it seems that that uncertainty is a little bit part and parcel of unconventional monetary policy. So I would like now to give the uh, word to uh, Jean-Claude Richet, if he agrees. I have some comment on this. Well, <clears throat> I, I, of course, it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I would say uh, on, on Rordi, uh, I have the following remark. Uh, it seems to me that those who are arguing in the leaning of, against the wind are more addressing the permanent decision-making process of uh, fixing up ex interest rates uh, than to, you know, attack specifically an identified bubble. I agree with him that when the bubble is there and when the, the bubble is the, of the kind that you were mentioning, uh, it's, and you demonstrate that very, very clearly, very unlikely that you would do a very good job. The problem is, before the bubble expanded, didn't you, were not you too accommodating, and too accommodating for a long time? And I join one of the remarks which has been made. Uh, and I have to say that uh, 
I am very much, uh, according to my own observation and experience, on the side of those who are, would think that a certain leaning against the wing is uh, necessary. In any case, we have the macro potentials. We have the uh, all kind of potentials that obviously are uh, extremely important. And if I take the bubble, the housing bubble in the euro area, in particular in Spain and in uh, uh, Ireland, in a single currency area, it's absolutely clear that the instrument which was at stake was, of course, the potentials by uh, all possible channels. Uh, to last, I would say, uh, I feel a little bit uneasy uh, with this presentation because my, my main fear in the present situation is precisely we are making a 100% correlation between the zero bound interest rates and the non unconventional measures. I, I agree that, of course, there is a point there, but my understanding of the present crisis is that it's not really the point. The point is that we have on the one hand the standard measures and we should continue to be careful with the zero interest rates. I'm not speaking particularly in, in Switzerland, but in general, in the advanced economy. And it seems to me that the unconventional measures are much more associated with, again, the fact that we had the worst financial crisis in the advanced economy since World War II and perhaps since World War I. And I can you know, demonstrate that. The first unconventional measures we took in the ECB was to supply liquidity on an unlimited basis the 9th of August 2007. Our interest rates were at 4%. We didn't wait to be at zero and it would... We, we could not even imagine to go first to zero and then, no, we had total interruption, total disruption of the normal functioning of our money market. And we supplied liquidity on an unlimited basis. We were asked 95 billion euros, around 95 billion euros. It was a, an immense shock because it was an immense, of course, uh, uh, supply of liquidity on one shot for 24 hours, by the way, not for a long period of time. And uh, uh, I have to say that I remain extremely attached to this principle. You should have the interest rate which is needed, taking everything into account, including the unintended consequences of having for a long time zero interest rates, nominal. On the other hand, you have to deal with the fact that you have disruption of markets, uh, absence of normal intermediation in your own market, which is the case, obviously, in all advanced economy. I put Switzerland totally apart because Switzerland is in a totally different universe, of course. But I, I ask you to reflect on, on that because, I mean, if really we are observing a new crisis of any kind and that we can say, well, were we right to have zero interest rates everywhere in the West, in the Western countries and in Japan, for such a long period of time, and even promising that we would continue to go on and on and on in 13 and 14, and why not 15, I would, be, I would feel very, very uneasy. Again, we can make mistakes. It's not excluded that we are making mistakes today. Uh, and to Philippe, I, I would reassure him, uh, the, euro current, the euro as a currency is extremely resilient extremely solid and the Swiss National Bank is very wise in pegging the Swiss franc to the euro. <laughs> Don't forget, we set up the euro at $1.17. During all the worst crisis since World War II, we were over and above 1.17. From 07, start for us, of the crisis. Up to now, we are over and above that level. So the, the problem of the Swiss franc is that most of the major currencies of the advanced economy are at a level which, of course, pushes up uh, dramatically the Swiss franc. But uh, I have to say that uh, the reference of the euro is certainly a good one for you. And when we speak of the problems 
of the euro area, we are speaking of problems of signature, sovereign signature, some sovereign signature in the euro area. Financial stability in the euro area, not currency problem. Again, the currency is backed by extraordinarily strong fundamentals, perhaps not as strong as the Swiss fundamentals, but much stronger than what you are observing in the US or in Japan. So I mentioned that en passant. Thank you very much. So the time for a very uh, quick round of reply that will probably not be able to address so many questions, but uh, let's make a selection. Start from Philippe, going in reverse order. Okay, so I will uh, stick to the potential scenario that uh, there could be uh, at least a depreciation of the euro and else ask uh, uh, why, should we, why sh should this hurt? I think this would hurt if uh, you have a deviation from purchasing power parity. That, I think that's the main point. Otherwise, inflation and exchange rate would, would uh, adjust and it, it wouldn't matter. So in, in the short run, it hurts because uh, exchange rate moves and not prices. And in the medium run, if you buy a currency that is undervalued, then it will also uh, hurt in the, in the medium long run. So that, that's a, it's a, it's a, a worry uh, to have. Um, the um, increase in uh, uncertainty, um, Daron, uh, I think the, the main uncertainty comes within Europe comes from the Eurozone uh, problems, political Eurozone. So monetary policy could help uh, on the margin by uh, trying to uh, talk about exit strategies, etc. Uh, uh, but they will not uh, uh, make much, uh, a, a big difference, in particular if I think about the Swiss monetary policy. They could have done it better by announcing things better, uh, uh, but this couldn't change the, the overall uh, uncertainty, contrarily to maybe uh, uh, the, the, US, uh, the US case. Uh, Marcus, about uh, the, uh, the cycle, I, indeed uh, my cycle is simple, but I still feel that the exchange rate risk is there. So you're talking about default risk, but the exchange rate risk, even if uh, uh, the cycle goes further, it will still be in euro, and, and uh, while the liability of the Swiss National Bank are, are in Swiss francs. So, Lars. Okay, on, on Marcus' question, suppose the world consists of two countries and both are uh, in a liquidity trap. I actually happen to have a paper on precisely that case, and if one of them expands doing the full foolproof way, uh, lowers the real interest rate, for normal parameters actually both gain, but for some parameters one gain and the other loses. But the reason the other gains is that when the first country expands, it also expands its demand for import, which is the export of the other country. And, and, and that effect can actually dominate from the, from the, from the real exchange rate. Uh, as a more general proposition, if many countries in the world, and few, quite a few of them now, are constrained by the zero lower bound, of course we have the other unconventional methods, uh, quantitative easing and so on, which can help to expand in, 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 uh, and avoid the recession in all, all, all countries. Uh, on this issue of uh, whether large balance sheets uh, uh, is, a, uh, is an inflation time bomb or not, the fact is uh, that nowadays uh, uh, also the Fed has got uh, a legal change so the Federal Reserve can pay interest on bank reserves. And that means that you break the connection between the price level and the, 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 the monetary base regardless of the size of the balance sheet and regardless of what assets the central bank has it can always raise the interest rate in the economy, the policy rate and if there, is, or if there are inflationary tendencies uh, it can raise the interest rate and affect aggregate demand and prevent that inflation from being too high. And it can do that without exiting from, 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 uh, from all, the, all, all, all the assets it has purchased. There are some restrictions still, but, but I don't have time to go into that. But basically, the old textbook correlation between the monetary base and the price level is gone, thanks to the fact that central banks can pay interest on, on, on reserves. Uh, on this, this uh, difficult question, should uh, the Swiss National Bank have picked 1.4 instead of 1.2? As I said, I cannot give advice on, on other countries' uh, <laughs> uh, uh, monetary policy, but of course the full foolproof way that I, I talked about, that I recommended for Japan, was precisely that you should have a price level target somewhere above your current price level. And that meant that you would actually depreciate your currency 
so that the, 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 the new exchange rate was in line with, with that higher price level. So, so, so uh, there, there, there are some possibilities to do that, but of course one has never tried the full foolproof way, so one doesn't really know whether it would work. Uh, Daron said uh, that uncertainty contributes, and of course there are discussions about uh, uh, whether the economy is as responsive to monetary policy as usual when there is more uncertainty, and that may or may, be, may not be the case. But one thing, with more transparent policy and clear objectives and, uh, and uh, also clear exit strategies, one can of course try to reduce the uncertainty as much as, uh, as one uh, can. Uh, on on Jean-Claude, Jean the, the uh, identification with the zero lower bound uh, and unconventional non-standard measures that, that I, I brought up, I think we actually have to distinguish, I talked only about monetary policy. I think one has to distinguish importantly between monetary policy and financial stability policy. Uh, uh, when central banks do some things, it's actually for monetary policy purposes to, to affect inflation and, and the real economy, employment and GDP. When they do other things, the, the, it is financial stability which is the focus. For instance, credit easing, liquidity provision, getting spreads down, uh, making, making markets work uh, is, is, in my mind, financial stability policy. Not, not, not directly monetary policy. Of course, each policy has implications for the other policy, but the main purpose of the policy defines whether, whether, whether what it is, and then there are side effects, but usually smaller than the, the main effects. I don't have time to go into this in, 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 in detail. I would like to say something uh, also on this issue of leaning against the wind and whether to use monetary policy. Uh, for that purpose or not. I think, if, in particular, if you're worried about housing prices and worried about household debt, there are two questions one has to ask. First, are household debt and housing prices at a level which is unsustainable? Do they, do they, do, do they bring problems that need to be taken into, that need to be handled? That is the first question. The other question is, if there is a problem, is monetary policy the best available instrument to, to, to handle the problem? I think if one goes first to the second question, the first question, whether, that is, uh, whether they are problems or not, depends from country to country, and you have to analyze sustainability, resilience, and so on. But anyhow, the second qu question, if, is, if, is monetary policy a suitable instrument or means to do this? I think we have pretty firm evidence and there's a lot of research supporting that it is not. And there's actually, there's an excellent paper by, by Katrin uh, Assen, Marcel Wesche and Stefan Gerlach, published in, published in Economic Policy. They look at data from 18 countries and they show that if you want to prevent housing prices from increasing by 10, otherwise increasing by 10%, you need to raise the interest rate so much so that you end up uh, uh, losing 4% of, 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 of GDP. If you have a normal Oaken coefficient of 2, that means you increase unemployment by 2 percentage points. 2 percentage points unemployment for 10% uh, housing prices. I think that is an extremely bad uh, trade-off. And, and, and there are much better instruments, loan-to-value uh, caps, uh, mortgage deduction rules, yeah, uh, importantly, risk weights for mortgages in banks, uh, in, 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 in banks' capital requirements. There is a long list of other instruments which are much more effective and do not have these drastic uh, consequences for, for, uh, for employment and, and, and the real economy. So regardless of whether they are a problem or not, in my mind, one should not use monetary policy for that purpose. I probably overextended my time. I apologize for that. Thank you very much, Lars. Jordan. Just, uh, very quickly. On why the interest rate had been singled out as the instrument to use to, to fight the bubble. Again, I think it's, it's the result of the, uh, the this misconception of, of mistaking bubbles as, as if they behaved as fundamental values. So it's, the interest rate is certainly a good instrument to affect the fundamental value of an asset. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a good uh, instrument to affect the, the bubble, at least in the direction that we want. I fully sympathize with Lars's remarks about other instruments to use. I guess one should look, if, the, if, the, if we believe the, the, the bubble is, uh, is um, uh, associated with a specific market, we should use instruments that f directly focus on that market. Also, to think what a bubble is. A bubble, uh, the, the reason why there is a bubble is because some people are willing to, to pay too much for an asset because they think that they will be able to sell it for even uh, for even a higher price. So, um, we may want to uh, penalize uh, purchases that are motivated by this uh, speculative, uh, speculative uh, motive. So, for instance, we may treat. Uh, uh, assets uh, holdings differentially from the viewpoint of taxation de depending on the holding period okay and penalize more uh, um, um, purchases that or, or, or the capital gains that uh, are associated with uh, short uh, holding periods um, on, I'll try to link a couple of, of questions on, I, I sympathize with Daron's uh, point that uh, uncertainty and, and, and the current environment in which there is a lot of uncertainty about many uh, have many issues may deter investment. Now, uh, but as, as Laura said, if, if um, central bankers uh, are good at explaining that there is a clear exit strategy for current unconventional policies, that there is no, mm, I would say, we can, one should never say there is no risk at all, but there, there, it's, it's hard to think of a, a situation in which the current unconventional policies would lead to high inflation. This, there is no this link that some people seem to have permanently in mind between M and P. It's not a simple link. You don't increase M and P immediately increases. It's complicated. It works, it works through the real sector. You know, prices are set by firms, so it takes a, a large expansion and the markets, labor markets becoming tight and so on for prices to keep increasing. And when central banks see that happening, they can respond. That doesn't happen overnight. They can respond, and as, as Lars said, they have a way to raise interest rates, and they can raise interest rates as much as they want. There is no uh, upper bound uh, uh, to, to how much uh, interest rates can do. So inflation, if, a central bank, if central bankers are committed, inflation can always be uh, uh, fought uh, against. And I'll, I'll leave it here. So I'd like to thank the panelists for this uh, very uh, stimulating and interesting discussion. Thank you very much, everybody.